more on the markets right now, we want to bring in Jeremy Siegel. He is Professor Emeritus of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. He's also Chief Economist at Wisdom Tree. And Jeremy, the thing that um, I've been watching pretty closely lately is just how Treasury yields have moved up. They're a little lower today, but they have moved up substantially in recent weeks as we got these hotter than anticipated inflation numbers. And yet the stock market keeps hitting new highs. If the Fed comes out and is hawkish today, can that continue? I think the Fed will be hawkish today. Uh, in fact, I'm expecting the number of cuts to de decline from the three that we saw in December uh, to two. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, more people, uh, more FOMC members uh, predicted less than two than more than two. Huh. Uh, I think the economy has remained very, very strong, um, stronger than the Fed expected, uh, very definitely. So they're in no rush uh, to uh, actually uh, cut the rate. So I, I, I think um, I, I'm not sure the market is quite prepared for that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've been hearing that most most observers still think that they're going to do three cuts by year end. But but I, I don't think so. I think right now they're predicting two. Of course, circumstances will evolve as they evolve. They can't predict the future. But at least at this particular point, I think there's going to be a shift to um, hawkishness today at the uh, at the meeting. Jeremy, how much of the gains we're seeing in the market do you think is predicated on the Fed being more aggressive with rate cuts, how much is just based on this great economy itself? Um, because I guess the, the good news in all of this is if the Fed's not cutting rates, it's because the economy's looking pretty good. Absolutely. I've said that before. It's more important that the economy stays strong and then earnings stay up than whether the Fed cuts in June or, or July or September or October. Uh, as I said, probably some of the worst news, if if you heard they're going to cut 100 basis points in the next three or four months, I would say, oh, my God, what happened? This is not good. So uh, it is absolutely the strong economy that's driving the earnings. And that's why they seem to be ignoring whether, hey, whether we're really going to have three or four cuts, because it is more important for economic strength for the stock market than when they're going to cut. Now, what is important that the, is that the Fed doesn't make a mistake and wait too long. But there's no sign that if they see the economy really slowing, that they won't then cut the rates. I think that was the signal that was given last December that encouraged the market still on the table. If we see weakness, we will cut rates. If we don't see weakness, then uh, at this particular point, we're happy with the rates as they are. Uh, you know, their their measure of inflation is is stickier. My measure is is it's lower because of the shelter distortion. But nonetheless, the economic uh, activity is the main uh, mover of uh, how they change the Fed funds rate. OK, um, if. You're right. They're more hawkish. They don't cut rates. We do continue to see the strong economy. Where, what's your guess for where stocks wind up um, later this year? Well, I, th I think that, you know, again, they might hiccup at two o'clock. When we get that uh, two o'clock dot plot, I, I think there might be a hiccup. I think uh, during the news conference, Powell is actually repeats a lot of what the projections are. He's not going to back off, although he's, you know, I, I, I think that I think that today might not be the best day for risk assets. But I think mm -hmm. that once people the realize, term, hey, okay. he's doing, yeah, once, exactly. Once he says, well, that's because the economy is so strong. I don't think this bull market is over. I think we still the momentum is still there, still on the upside. Um, uh, I don't think we've seen the highs of the year. Okay, one quick question for you. Do you think the leadership remains with the technology stocks and others, or do you think the baton gets handed off and, and manufacturing and other sectors kind of pick up and run? I think they will eventually, but right now I still think the technology stocks have the momentum. Price of Bitcoin sliding since hitting an all-time high last week. Uh, the cryptocurrency dipping below $61,000 uh, earlier today. It, you, it was right, Becky. It never did, I don't think, uh, go under 60 at this point. Doesn't mean it won't. Joining us to talk more about the crypto market, Diogo Monica, co-founder of crypto platform Anchorage Digital. Uh, as of today, uh, he's a general partner 
at Hahn Ventures, and he's transitioning from president to chairman of, of Anchorage. And for people who don't know, who don't know Diogo is the Portuguese uh, version of Diego, which may or may not be the Spanish version of James. Right, that's right. And the way that I describe it is Diego is the Spanish version of Diogo. Of Diogo, that came first. Yeah, the Portugal the, it, right. is better. Right. Do you know what it means, though? The, the Spanish origin is, means supplanter, which is pretty um, exactly right. Yeah. That's right. during your, <laughs> your profession. It, we have seen stuff happen with Bitcoin that, you know, if you're not ready, if you, if you don't have a firm conviction, there are times it just shakes anyone who's holding one just to the core it goes last time I went to 65 I went to you know next thing you knew it was, it was 17 went to 20 next thing you knew it was two something like that so this is probably not surprising that we were at what what is your high about 74 where were we last week it was around 74,000 yeah, right. all right so immediately we go we were down as low as under 61 that, that's a, a big haircut why I thought that there you know, that, that everybody's holding them, so the ETFs that are buying them can't get any, there's no supply, the halving's coming. How can it move down, whatever that is, that, that huge percentage move? Look, the reality is if you told me a year ago that we were gonna have a correction down to 63,000, I would have been ecstatic. That would have been a That's fantastic, true. fantastic price for us. Yes, the ETFs have had a big impact on the price appreciation in twofold. The first one is the fact, of course, that if you make something easier to buy, there will be more demand, and more demand than supply means prices go up. But the most important point here is actually what the ETF for Bitcoin being approved meant. It actually means that regulators can't stand in the way of legitimate products and financial products forever. So what we're going to see and what the market is actually counting on is definitely a set of new crypto products that will come to market soon. Um, Ethereum ETFs, Solana ETFs, many of these other crypto products that I'm sure are coming to market. So it's really this uh, starting gun that's what is happening and not really just a Bitcoin ETF on its own. One of our frequent guests on, who's been pretty good in, in a lot of different areas, Tom Lee, said it, that the institutional adoption and just the the overall adoption has been much faster than he thought. That's or absolutely right. One of the things that was necessary for a Bitcoin ETF to be approved in the first place was that we needed all of the infrastructure that was at the same level of quality and reliability as the infrastructure from traditional finance is for traditional ETFs. And that's what we've got. We've got that with companies like Anchorage Digital, which is still the only federally chartered bank in the US and now actually has over $50 billion in assets under custody. This is a big player in the market with an OCC chartered bank that is helping institutions custody, buy and sell, and stake their assets. Uh, we've had people come on and say, last time when Bitcoin hits a, a new high, it does X in the next month. We've had people come on and say, uh, after a halving, which we saw a couple of years ago, Bitcoin does Y over the next couple of months. Do you expect what do you expect? In, when's it having next month? Is it April? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be around next month. The most exciting thing about uh, joining on ventures as a general partner is that I'm a venture investor and venture investors are not hedge funds. Uh, the time horizon for us is really seven to ten years. And so, yes, we have liquid positions of tokens, but we also invest in equity and we really take a very long term view to the market, which to your prior question really is the only way to keep sanity in a market with this level of volatility that is baked in. The, sometimes people use a stock to flow model to try to value Bitcoin and they compare it to gold. When you do have a halving, you're going to have half as much over that next year to base your stock to flow on. I mean, just by math, if it was worth X, it should be worth 2X. Shouldn't yes, it? assuming that, of course, I think the criticism is the other side is it is already baked in. Bitcoin right. is not like gold. Gold is actually pretty steady in terms of uh, the percentage of inflation on a yearly basis. And maybe we shouldn't call it inflation, new gold that is actually right. dug from the ground. Bitcoin is programmatic and algorithmic. That we know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, when the health end will happen. So it's very easy to predict what is the total supply, which will never pass 21 million. So uh, with gold, uh, when prices go up, more people can and try and find more so it's not you can't count on exactly what the fixed rate of production per year is that changes with Bitcoin it can't change that is correct and gold has been pretty steady but Bitcoin is cryptographic and it is code it, it is code and, it, and it's mathematics 
All that taken into consideration can still be either worth, at any given time, be worth seventeen thousand or sixty-five thousand, what, what, or seventy-five thousand. What, what do you? I know you're talking seven to ten years, but can it go back to forty thousand? Will it go back to forty? The, the exciting part about being a venture investor is that you're looking at investments that have to be able to ten x at least. That is to be ten x. Ten x. Could it go back to forty? Could it go to forty? I think volatility is big ten. Yes, it could back to forty. It could go higher. That's short the less term. Exciting part of it. It's 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 not oh, that's exciting. exciting. <laughs> it's just part of it. Uh, I've been in this space for almost ten years, and um, I started with my co-founder this company Anchorage Digital seven years ago, and so we have seen five plus cycles. It has always been this way. At this point, it is just a lot easier to go through a bear market, and in fact, the bear markets are actually the better times to build because there's a lot less attention in the ecosystem, and you're actually building the technology, and you're not just just talking about the price action. But there will be waves and I guess tides that come in. I was just reading about how there was actual outflows for the first time in some of these Bitcoin ETFs. That's right. And the price actually is very convenient to bring attention to the space. And every time you bring attention to the space, what you realize is that more people join. And more importantly, more developers, more entrepreneurs, more engineers start building in the space. And those don't go away when the market eventually corrects and when the price comes down. And they will stay and they will build new products and new companies. And that's actually what I'm the most excited about as a general partner at Hon Ventures is to invest in this new way of entrepreneurship. The Fed is set to conclude its two-day policy meeting. Uh, and our next guest says that the central bank's premature dovishness is coming home to roost in the form of increased risk of uh, stagflation. Joining us now is Kamal Shri Kumar, president of Shri Kumar uh, Global Strategies. Shri, it's, it's uh, good to have you on, and, and there's a lot of uh, cross currents. A lot of uh, good to see it. A lot of cross currents uh, in this, and things I, I have questions about. I guess your base case uh, is that that it's. The, the strength that we're seeing, continued strength in the economy, makes rate cuts unlikely, in your view, maybe even for the year, uh, and that the risk is, since we don't get rate cuts, we could eventually have a hard landing. That's correct. All of the above that you said, Joe, and I think I saw no reason for the dovishness that we saw from the chairman in his December 13th press conference. He again repeated it before the Senate Banking Committee earlier this month, talking about interest rates being quite close by. And then the, clearly the markets reacted to it. There is a rally, and the rally makes it more difficult to control inflation at a future point in time. It would have been better to be more cautious on the forecast in terms of expectations so that you don't have to reverse, and that is the risk I think the Fed is running. They give rise to expectations of rate cuts, eventually to have to say this cost a rally, this eased financial conditions, now we may have to tighten again. Seems insane. It does seem crazy if you've had 18 straight records in, in the averages, the stock market averages that, that you're thinking about cutting, but we do have an election uh, coming. I know they're not political, but you know, they can't help but feel the political winds a little bit. Uh, well, I, they are political. I have always maintained that the Fed is a political entity. The talking about being independent is just a smokescreen. In reality, they have been very vulnerable to political changes. Even if you go back to history, toward the end of 1971, Arthur Burns, the Fed chairman, writes into the FOMC minutes that they have to be increasing interest rates in 1971 because we will not be able to do that next year, 1972, which will be an election year. So there have been explicit references to politics and to pretend that this is an apolitical entity just doesn't make sense. And look again at one of the other things they have to think about this week, Joe. They have to think in terms of slowing quantitative tightening. In other words, the rate at which they put bonds back into the market. But where were we? 2008, at the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Fed balance sheet was about 5% of GDP. But the beginning of COVID in 2020, it rose to 19%. By 2022, two years later, it had increased to 35% of GDP. So when are we going to go back to a more normal level? So that is not mentioned either. So we are 
left with increasingly dominant Federal Reserve in the market of uh, market performance. I'll tell you the one thing that, that I, I didn't quite understand, Shri. You, you think the 10-year the might be a buy. You think rates are kind of peaking there, uh, and it might be buy for the next couple of years, because you think if it were to go up from here, something might break. So it's not going to go up. But, I mean, the 10-year doesn't its, its behavior isn't dictated by whether it's going to, to break something. It goes where it's going to go, and then things break. Uh, you, you hope that they don't, but that's the way it happens. You think that just the possibility that something could break means that the, the, the rates don't go up to 5 percent or whatever, 4 and 3 quarters? Right. This, this is the sequence. This is the logical sequence as I see it. If you have the Fed not cutting interest rates not only the, today, but also May 31st or June 12th. Then there is a pressure to push the 10-year yield up. We see the two-year yield has already gone up significantly. What happens then is that the problems of mid-sized small banks, which bought 10-year treasuries at 2%, they are going to be more underwater than they are today. The commercial real estate issues are going to get even worse. Those are the types of things that makes the Fed reverse and increase liquidity, cut interest rates, and that in turn brings the 10-year yield down. That's the sequence of my thinking. Your most recent article, it really focused on some concerns about, you know, inflation being more persistent than we previously thought. You're also focused on that most recent read on inflation with CPI. How big of a factor do you think that is for all the Fed members and for Jay Powell? You know, I think that they always try and play down one month of data, but in this case, we've actually seen CPI kind of flatline over the last five or six months. And so I think that the fact that we're not seeing the kind of progress that they had been previously enjoying when it comes to those inflation readings, that has to factor into their thinking here. You know, they can't completely ignore the fact that inflation was coming down and that it now seems to be moving in a straight line right around 3%. And so I think, you know, their, their official target, that personal consumption expenditures number, is is still a little bit lower and is expected to stay below 3%, even with the recent pickup in, in core inflation. But I think they've got to be at least wary that maybe the progress that they've seen, which had been so steady toward the end of last year, might be might be hitting a little speed bump here. So you say wary. I think they like to say data dependent. So I want to ask you, and I asked one of our previous guests earlier today, um, you're looking at headline CPI, and you're saying that's showing sticky inflation. But coming up, we have PCE that we often call their preferred gauge. And generally, I think the common, the, the most uh, consensus thinking is that they're really focused on core as opposed to headline. So coming up, which one's more, uh, which was more important, the PCE coming up or the CPI that we just had? You know, I think I think they both matter in their own way. Right. I think that the the PCE is the one that they officially target, but the CPI comes out in a lot, you know, a much more timely manner. And so if they're making these decisions, I think they've got to think about what just happened with CPI because they know based on that the PCE is likely to look a little bit firmer than it otherwise would have. Um, and so I, I think both of these matter. I think those core numbers, as you referred to, those are the ones that I think they're going to be watching very closely, and particularly what they call core services, so like a measure, core in particular, core services X housing, so a measure of things that are really responsive to wage increases. That core services X housing measure has been a little bit firmer than I think anybody had expected over the last couple of months, and I think that's going to be making them a little bit nervous because they think that's the measure they can move the dial on by cooling or, or slowing down, down the economy. Okay. And the fact that it's picking up not is obviously not good news from their perspective. All right, so we're really focused on the rate decision, but the Fed's got a lot of business to get handled in this meeting where you will be there. You're actually going to be there in the room. Uh, the other one is the FOMC rate expectations. A lot of people call that the dot plot. And also their summary of economic uh, projections, which includes their GDP outlook. What are you expecting from that? Yeah, you know, I think the economic projections are going to be the really closely watched thing at this meeting. It's kind of all about the dots, because we are expecting that we might see a shift in the dots. Previously, we saw an expectation for three rate cuts this year. It's entirely possible that that's going to fall back to two rate cuts. So a slightly dialed back expectation for how much they're going to lower borrowing costs this year. I think that would be pretty notable if that happened, obviously, especially if it came alongside a sort of upgrade in how much growth we're expecting to see, and if it came alongside a downgrade in how much disinflation we're expected to see. So I think I'll be very closely watching to see what those economic projections do. Um, and then we also, you know, we might hear something about the balance sheet at this meeting. We know that the Fed's going to discuss it. So I think, I think it's actually quite a lot of moving parts at this 
this meeting. Yeah, quite a few. And uh, you're going to be looking, you know, eye to eye with Jay Powell later. You're going to be in that room able to ask a question. So I want to ask you, uh, what question, if you can tell us, if you can telegraph it to us a bit, what question do you, do you plan to ask or what question do you think needs to be asked, addressed, or just maybe what needs to be clarified? Yeah, you know, I think it depends on where I fall in the order. But I think one thing that I'm really interested in is he, he suggested that, you know, the time for rate cuts is going to come soon at his congressional testimony a few weeks ago. And, A, I want to know what that soon meant. You know, what, how, how quickly are we talking here? And, B, I want to know, you know, in why would you cut rates at a moment when inflation seems to be stubborn and growth is really solid? Like, what do you see as the risk or the threat that is so significant to the economy that it's worth taking that risk of doing it prematurely? And so I think, I think some version of that would be my question. The S&P 500 lifting to a new intraday record high above 50. 200, the prior intraday high around 51.89. Of course, any rise today is a new closing high. You see the Nasdaq up 1%. Russell 2000 small caps outperforming up 1.6%. Now, Treasury yields relaxing a bit lower, but mostly on the short end uh, as we sort of get a little more confidence that the Fed anticipates three quarter point rate cuts perhaps by the end of this year. The 10 year uh, moving less. So you see a little bit of re steepening of the curve. Maybe that suggests uh, that the uh, more tolerance for some warmer inflation. But I would say, in general, uh, Chair Powell talks about the balance of risks uh, between employment and inflation roughly equal, but he's not particularly concerned about any of them. So let's get to uh, Josh Brown. He is uh, CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, Liz Young, uh, SoFi, uh, head of investment strategy. Just to break this down a little bit, Josh, um, markets seem to take the absence of any hawkish surprise as, as a positive. It's like we were in a strong market before. Um, the chair is unconcerned seemingly about the little bit of an uptick in inflation and so therefore kind of game on. Yeah, my big takeaway that is really that they're going to slow the pace of balance sheet runoff, which I found, I guess, to be uh, something unique. Uh, I also think this they're talking quote, about it, but they haven't decided anything. yet. But it's definitely an indication. I mean, slowing the pace of balance sheet runoff reminds me of uh, when Henry Blodgett was posting all this stuff from Hussman. So somebody said, well, you're going to sell your stocks then if you're so bearish. He said, I'm going to stop reinvesting my right. dividends. <laughs> OK. All right. We got it. All right. So that's that's one thing. Here was the other one. This is a quote. The risk is two sided. If we ease too much, we could see higher inflation. If we ease too little, we could risk damage the economy. Okay, thanks. For those people who have not been paying attention yeah. to what the balancing act is, there it is. And quite frankly, nothing really seems to have changed to the point on either side of that balancing act to push the Fed. And really, I, I think we're enduring higher 10-year rates fairly well in the broader market, which is certainly not the purview of the Fed, what the 10-year does. You know they're paying attention. Yeah. Consider this, Mike. Um, you've got seven basis points in the last week. You've got 41 basis points year to date. It's a fairly substantial move in the 10 year. Stocks are weathering that really well. Yeah. So today didn't really give you anything new on that front. And I think the balancing act has to continue. That is true. Although, again, you know, first of all, we always Liz, should uh, throw out the, the little bit of a disclaimer that a lot of times post Fed moves are kind of like whipsaw one way, then the other way. Right now, it doesn't so. seem like there's a lot of room for interpretation here. But, you know, if you look at the um, the summary of economic projections, which came out along with it, they keep the median of three anticipated quarter point cuts by the end of this year. Some of the highs and lows changed in there. So there's a fewer deep doves and, and not as much, uh, you know, in the middle. But I, I guess I would say is it also comes with a higher than anticipated GDP for the year and a slightly higher core uh, PCE inflation. Now, Powell seemed to say, well, that's just kind of marking the market what we know for the first two months here. It's not projecting ahead. But I guess that's understandable the market would take that as uh, a net positive. I, I think it is understandable that the market takes it as a positive, and, and we should, frankly. If you're looking at just the math of it, which had concerned me earlier in the year, the math of them projecting 1.4 percent GDP growth, and we were still supposed to somehow generate double-digit earnings growth, it just didn't make sense. So I think their projection to bring GDP growth up is a positive. Obviously, inflation a little higher, not as much of a positive, but not quite as concerning if everybody still thinks the labor market is going to be strong. People can spend and absorb that inflation if they're employed and they're confident in their wages staying steady. 
The thing that I think is interesting, they did lower the expected number of cuts in 2025. Now we're just kind of pushing out the worry into the future even further. So we came into the year thinking we were going to get six cuts. The market has completely weathered that storm, brought it down to three, and been quite resilient yeah. throughout, but lowered what we, we think might happen in 25. Rate, sens rate sensitive stocks, though, are moving. Yeah. And I found this really interesting. Uh, the ARC names, well, uh, the, the ARC ETF itself is up 3%. Uh, metals and mining up 2%. The regional banks are up 2%. Yeah. Like these, these jumped out at me. Um, and, and then I think if you look at the Russell 2000 on the whole, so you're up 2%. Uh, if you finish the day where we are right now, it's the second best day of the year uh, for that index. So those things were interesting. Also should not be glossed over. While Chair Powell was speaking, we printed a, a new all-time yeah. record high in the S&P 500 above 5,200.